Thanks for having me today, everyone. Um, we're going to change gears a little bit. I'm going to talk about gamification. Can I get a show of hands who's heard of gamification before? Great. Keep your hand up if you um, can give me an example of gamification. Okay, great. <laughs> Excellent. Um, it's a pretty new field. It's a very interesting field. Um, so I'm going to give you an introduction today. So who am I? Uh, I'm Kirsten Oberpiller. Um, I wear several hats. Um, one of them is an executive designer um, at ThinkPlace. Uh, where we do a lot of uh, consulting work for government, um, design thinking, innovation, and trying to uh, do things in a different way. I'm also founder and lead gamification designer for PentaQuest, which is a gamification consulting firm, and I'm a PhD researcher at the University of Canberra, also looking at gamification. So I'm a little bit obsessed. <laughs> um, also, fair warning, I get very excited when I talk about gamification, so I'm going to speak fast um, and I'm going to lose track of time, but um, if you have permission to wave at me. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to talk um, a little bit about what gamification is. I'm going to throw a bunch of examples at you and then talk a little bit about how, you, um, uh, you know, how it can be applied. So, first of all, why is this even a thing? Well, when we talk about um, games and playing, that's something that's been around as long as we've been around. Play is such an important aspect of who we are. If you notice children or, or pets, when they get up, the first thing they do is play. Because it's not just for fun, it serves very important psychological, social and even biological functions. And play has been around for ages. So if you see up here, we've got um, an ancient example of, of dice. And so everyone knows dice. We've, they're so common, they've been around for thousands and thousands of years. We have um, a game of Mancala here, a bean counting game, very common uh, in Africa. This is a picture of um, someone in ancient Egypt playing something that looks remarkably similar to chess. And she's not playing it for fun, she's playing it for strategic thinking. And we've got backgammon, which has been around for 5,000 years. So there's something about these that is so engaging to us that they've stuck around. So why is it? Well, games hack into something psychologically in our brain that makes them so engaging and so fun. And any type of human behaviour is, is down to, to eight drivers. So I'm going to go through them, have a think about which ones... Uh, that might, might resonate particularly with you. We're all driven by all of them, but have a think. The first one is, is a higher purpose, having something bigger than ourselves to work towards. Uh, this is why we donate to charity, this is why we volunteer, and I dare say this is why you're here um, as you know, part of the defence force, because you're wanting to serve your nation, do something beyond yourself. We've got mastery, the, the sense of progression, of achievement. Hey, I'm getting better at this thing. We've got autonomy, the ability to make choices, to choose or not to choose. Relatedness, that's the social side of things. That's why we've got a Twitter board, you know. Um, it's really about connecting with, with other people. Creativity, this is why we love art, painting, creating. Uh, this is why we like avatars in games, because we can create something. Games like Minecraft tap into this drive really well, because you can create something uh, of your own. Ownership. This is owning land, defending it, um, or um, having a, a collection, stamp collection. This is why we like to renovate our backyards and our houses, because we own it, we want to grow it, we want to protect it. Games like Farmville do this incredibly well. Unpredictability. The joy of surprise. <gasps> what was that? It's, it's, it's the, the things that um, uh, gambling machines hack into really well. I'm going to pull the lever. I don't know what's going to happen, but it's going to be exciting. And shows like Game of Thrones do this really well as well. Will your favourite character die? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> but there's something uh, really enticing about surprise and unpredictability. And a really important one, loss and scarcity. Um, there's a, a, a whole range of studies showing that we feel fear and pain and loss up to five or even ten times more than we do uh, pleasure. So there's something really motivating about loss and scarcity. Um, and you see this, this sort of... Uh, uh, being used in sales. Hurry, while stocks last, only five left, be the first to do X. And so these things, um, you know, are activated when we interact with people, with products, with companies, and, and games as well. Now, games are made up of things called game mechanics. They're the elements that make up game play. Um, but they're actually not limited to card games, board games, video games. They're actually in your life already. So the very first one, you'll be familiar with grabbing a coffee. You see loyalty programs, you know. 
buy nine coffees so I can get one free. That's a game mechanic being used to get you to come back to the same place, drink co coffee more often, more regularly, and to bring your friends. Same thing with your frequent flyer program. Who here is part of a frequent flyer program? Virtually everyone. Um, and you don't really think about that as, as a game mechanic or a gameplay, but there's certain behavior you're doing. You're getting rewarded with points, classic, uh, classic mechanic, um, and you get to redeem rewards. So the, the behavior that's being encouraged here is to try to get you to fly more, fly longer, um, and fly with the same airline. Same thing with credit cards. You know, more and more, get the premium credit card. You get discounts on your insurance or whatever it might be. Similar sort of, uh, sort of thing. And if you think about games, I mean, this is a game, not gamification, but soccer, right? If you think about it, what, what, is, what is soccer all about? Okay, well, it's putting a ball into a net. It's not very exciting. But we say, no, 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 you, there's rules around it. You can only touch it with your feet. And other, other rules I don't understand. But, <laughs> but you, we've, made, we've put in some, some additional obstacles to make it fun. Do you know how much soccer players get paid? Millions and millions of dollars. This is, this is a multi-million dollar industry of putting a ball into a net. But we love it. And if you think about it, school and education is a little bit like a game as well, isn't it? You've got levels. Uh, you know, you get graded. Um, at the end of the year, there's your, your big boss fight. We have an exam. And if you pass that exam, you get to move on to the next level. Arguably, you can argue whether it's a good game or not. Um, <laughs> but we, we're seeing some of these mechanics. And we've also got uh, the workplace and careers. It's kind of a similar thing, right? You level up. As you level up, you get more responsibility, but you also get more perks. Fancy title, badge, uh, you know, extra pay, nice car spot. And so all of these things are already in place in your life to, to get you to perform particular behaviors in a certain way. Okay, so what is gamification? Um, like I said, I'm a, I'm a PhD researcher, so I'm coming from the academic side, but I also work in this field and, and consult to teams. So I'm coming from both a practical and an academic point of view. And both in the industry and in academia, there's a lot of talk about what is gamification, what isn't it. Here's my definition. It's the use of game mechanics and experience design to engage users to solve real-world problems. And it's this engagement that makes it so popular, and it's the solving of real-world problems, which is why it's such an exciting thing. This is a, continuation, a continuum that I use to try to explain how it's different to games. So on one side, we have the game world. So every game I play is to win at the game. So when I play Monopoly, any behaviors I do is so I can win at Monopoly. When I finish that, the end, more or less. It's a closed system. On the other side, we've got the real world that we know and love uh, with all of our processes, all of our systems, um, everything like that. Several decades ago, we went, hey, there's something really engaging about games. People love games. They spend hours and hours and hours, and they're just completely focused. How can we use that? So when we start moving games this way, we have things like serious games, simulations, game-based learning, very, very popular in education. And what we're doing here is taking a game like Experience, but the purpose is not for fun. The purpose is for a real-world reason, skilling up, learning, so forth. Now what gamification is doing is pushing it even further this way. So we can do gamification for content, so making learning a little bit more fun, a little bit more, more meaningful and real. And we also have structural gamification, which is looking at behaviors in teams. Um, the more you go this side, the less game-like it becomes, and the more it just feels like everyday part of your life. Um, some quick trends. Um, Gartner Research predicts that gamification will have, um, that one in two, so 50% of businesses will have at least one gamified process by the end of 2018. So you're gonna see a lot more of it. I'm gonna give you plenty of examples as well. A, uh, a study by Talent LMS found that 79% of learners said that they would be more productive and learn more easily if their education was more game-like. They wanted things like recognition and competition and, and the social side of things. We're also seeing games and technology um, being more and more part of what, what, what we do. And we heard some great examples um, from the two speakers earlier. And by 2025, three out of four workers will be millennials. Now, they bring a very different expectations of the world and of the workplace um, and, and have high expectations for how you as an organization engage them. All right, so you might be like, okay, that's cool, Kirsten. I still don't quite know what you're talking about. Um, so I've got plenty of examples to show you. The first one is a quick video. <coughs>
up at there. So that's an example of playful design. A very simple thing. The, the mechanic is simple as, like the rules are, I step on the stair and it makes some sound. But that was enough to disrupt people, to make it a little bit more fun, and to get people to take the stairs instead of the escalator. Now, that's not going to address the obesity epidemic or anything like that, but it is a way of using game mechanics to nudge behaviour in the moment. This is um, another example from, uh, from Sweden uh, with the speed camera lottery. So speeding is a thing you know, we're all aware of and, and all guilty of, no doubt. But they went, how do we reduce speeding um, in this particular part of town? So one thing they did is they did an immediate feedback. So instant feedback is something that games do so well. You know exactly what the goal is and you know whether you're on track or not. So this was an instant red for bad, green for good, thumbs up, thumbs down. Cool, okay, <coughs> but there's more. If you are one of the people that got the green, that you were, you were going the right uh, speed limit, your name got entered into a lottery. So you potentially could you know, earn some money by being a safe driver. Want to guess where the money for the lottery came from? Mm. Yeah, from the people that got the speeding fines, <laughs> right? So it's a really cool way of, of flipping a problem on its head, um, making it positive, making it fun. Um, we talk, heard a little bit about wearables, um, very, very common. Um, this is an example of how Fitbit is using game-like mechanics to encourage you to, to exercise more. Again, feedback is one of these things that games do really well. So here what we have is we have a clear goal. 10,000 steps, that is my goal, and I get immediate feedback for how I'm doing. This person's doing really well, obviously. Um, immediate feedback, green, good, yeah, cool, I get it. We also see badges, a classic uh, game mechanic being used. So if when, when you achieve certain milestones, whether it's you know number of sneakers or you know number of floors you, you um, uh, climbed or whatever. Um, and we've also got um, competition between friends. Hey, I'm gonna walk more than you. Hey, let's run, I'm gonna beat your time. So you can see these mechanics are being used to get you to exercise more, run for longer, encourage uh, you know, with your friends and be like, oh, I'm at 10,000 steps. I might just walk around in a circle a little bit and you see people doing that. So you can see it's, it's nudging behavior in that way. Who's used Duolingo? Yeah. So Duolingo is the largest uh, language learning uh, app. Um, it's got 100 million downloads and 25 million active users a month. So it's just massive. Um, so what it does, it's got like 17 languages that you can learn online. But part of the reason why it's been so successful is because of its game-like interface. So you can see it feels quite fun, feels quite game-like. So one thing it's, if it's giving us here is some levels. I've done basics, phrases, and basics too, and I know what's coming next. Cool, I can see how I'm progressing. Um, it's also got uh, a social element here, so seeing who, who of your friends are there, being able to react to their statuses and so forth. But probably one of the things that, that's made it so successful is they try to get you to come back regularly. So Duolingo knows that you don't learn language just by sitting down for 10 hours straight and learning it, but you have to come back for regular practice. So what they have is a mechanic um, to get you to come back every day. So they say, just spend 10 minutes a day and you'll learn a language. So they have this, this seven day streak and so forth where you can double your points um, if you come back regularly. Chore Wars, uh, this is one I mentioned uh, in my TED talk. This one's about gamifying your household. So the members of your household choose a character. You've got a whole range here. You know, a wizard, an orc, uh, you know, monster thing, I don't know what that is. Um, you can choose an avatar, yeah. and you compete against each other to do household chores. And you can pick from a set ones, or you can make your own. 10 points for making the bed, 20 points for doing the dishes, 30 points for taking out the trash. So you've got a whole range of different things here. Um, and, and it's making the things that you have to do, your, ha your chores, and making it fun, turning it into a bit of a competition, and maybe for some people showing, see, I do do more of the housework than you. So, <laughs> um, This one's free, so if you want to use it with your kids or with your uh, you know, uh, house members, please feel free. Who's used the Parish on My Ride app? Yeah, a couple of you. So this is a, an example of, of a bit of gamification being applied locally. So Parish um, had, had, you know, you go there, you ski, you snowboard, you have fun. What they were trying to do is go, you know what, there's all this congestion in one part of the park. How can we get people to kind of spread around more evenly? And how can we make that experience a little bit more fun? So what they did, through your phone in a pocket, um, it could track where you're going. So you've got a bit of a map here. So green is, these are the types of, of peaks that you've, uh, you've gone to. Um, and here are the other ones 
that you should go to. Um, we've also got, the, the lifts written is basically badges, isn't it? So you're going, cool, these are all the lifts that I've gone to. And we've got a leaderboard as well. So you can track how many vertical meters uh, you uh, snowboarded or skied, um, how many lifts, uh, how many days. And you've got a leaderboard, so if you want to be a little bit competitive with your friends that day, your family that day, or just overall. <laughs> Thanks. I better hurry up. Um, the Amy Safe Driver app, uh, driver app um, again, looking at safe driving, um, again, uh, using your phone to, um, to measure it. They went, how do we encourage people to drive safely? Well, let's give them a score of safe driving. Well, what does safe driving mean? It means adhering to the speed limit, um, you know, how well you brake, whether you're using your phone or not. And how good your score was actually gave you discounts on your insurance premium. So this is also tailoring your insurance service based on your actual driving. Um, this one's more of a game, less, uh, less gamification. Um, I'm a martial artist, and so I thought you guys might, might like this one, but also because this is an example that gamification doesn't just have to be digital, but it can be the use of cards or board games. Um, this is helping uh, martial artists understand some of the theory of, um, of self-defense. Um, I am going short on time, so I'll just skip this one. Um, security risk, I thought this one might be uh, interesting for you. Um, this is, you know, very often government has those big old boring uh, training, mandatory trainings, here, read this giant manual, and it's, you know, not really fun. Um, this is a way to make security training more real, more realistic, and more engaging. So you can see we've got, uh, you know, um, the infrastructure per perimeter, so understanding where the exits are, and here we've got, you know, information breaches, understanding where there might be sensitive information being leaked. And so this is one way you can make training that you have to do a little bit more fun, a little bit more engaging, and hopefully more memorable. Um, this one's one um, by the ABS, using census data. We were talking about that before. Um, and getting you, and this is um, <coughs> live and free, so you can, you can download it as well, using census data where you can make the decisions. So you can run whichever town in Australia you want. You can run, be the mayor of Canberra. And you can use real census data to, to build a city and make decisions. And then you kind of... Um, play the game and, and see, see how, how the people respond to your decisions. Um, but it's quite fun, um, so have a look at that. This one I threw in because I thought you guys might be interested. Um, have you guys heard of America's Army? So this is um, uh, something they did to try to recruit people. Um, so you can see here, it's a very uh, you know, first-person shooter style game, but it was a game that was released. And so very similar to all, to all those sorts of games. You've got missions and quests and so forth, um, and you, know, you shoot, the shoot the bad guys. But what this was is it was aimed um, at their target market for recruiting. And this game, even though it took a lot of money and time to build something as complex as this, actually recruited more than any of their other marketing campaigns combined. So not only did it increase uh, the positive perception of the army, but they actually recruited from this as well. Um, I might just skip some of these. Um, this is an example that I'm working with um, with the Department of Industry. Um, so they're looking at how do we reward and recognize professional development? So um, this is a um, product we're building for them, which is trying to uh, uh, reward a whole range of different workplace behaviors. Things like attending your team meetings, uh, you know, making sure you've read the required documents, um, attending learn, um, learning and development courses, and so forth. Um, there's some point systems um, related to that, a bit of a dashboard, so you can see how you and your branch and your team are comparing to others. Um, and there's rewards as well. So if you're someone that's continuously investing in yourself professionally, you get access to conferences, coffees with seniors, you get to pitch your idea, um, that sort of thing. So you can see that gamification and game mechanics aren't new. They've been around for ages. But it's just now that we're getting the technology and, and the thinking around it that there's more and more examples coming up. Oh, that was not the right thing. Um, so I'll just uh, finish quickly. So what game mechanics do is about encouraging behavior. So there's something that they occur, a trigger, you do the behavior, and then you get rewarded. So there's releasing of um, neurotransmitters uh, in your brain. Um, when you, if you're thinking about applying gamification to, to your context, there's a bit of a process that you, you go through. Um, so this is design thinking process to really make sure that the mechanics are suited to your environment. So you can see from the examples I gave, there's so many different examples for all, all different, um, different situations. So you need to get, be really clear, what is the behavior that you're trying to change? Be really, really clear, be really crystal. <coughs> 
then you need to have a look at who are the people that we're targeting. Um, what is it? What motivations naturally um, are fit with their context? Go through um, uh, an iterative cycle of making it, t play testing it, learning it, improving it, um, launching it. So it's quite a new thing. So depending on, on where you're introducing it as well, there's often a lot of um, sort of preparing um, people for a different way of interacting, um, and then evolving it because behavior is not static over time. So you need some sort of way to say how is this changing the system, and, and what do I what do I do now? Um, so there's six key design decisions that you need to make. Um, again, the first is who and what. Who are you trying to target? What's the behavior you're trying to do? How game-like do you want it to be? So I showed you some examples that felt very much like a game, but then when you think about your frequent flyer program, it doesn't feel like a game at all. It feels a lot more professional and traditional. So there's a bit of a spectrum uh, where you can apply it. What's the gameplay pattern? You know, is it shoot the bad guy and win? Is it we're building something together? How do we win at this game? How does it work? What is the scale? Is it something you want to apply just within your team of 12? Is it something you want to apply, you know, Australia-wide? What level of scale are we talking about? Duration? Is it something you want to run just for a month, you know, one month com competition um, or one month ideas comp or whatever it is? Or is it something that you want to do uh, uh, over time? <laughs> um, so one of the, the companies I work with have been running a gamified process for four years, so it looks very different. And then the platform. Is it something, uh, you know, is it a board a physical board? Is it an app? Is it a card game? What does it look like? So my takeaways for you, um, and I'll be around uh, later on if you want to have a chat. Um, gamification is a new way to engage people and nudge behavior. And you're going to see a lot more of it. It also comes in many different shapes, sizes, and scales. So there's ways that you can start using um, fun to, to nudge behavior in a new way. Um, and to do it effectively, you need a design process. So you need to go through, um, go through that process there. And uh, that, that's it for me.